Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Inside Inter Miami, the Miami Herald's podcast on Inter Miami. I'm Andre Fernandez, deputy sports editor at the Herald, joined once again by our sports writer, Michelle Kaufman, who's covered the team since day one, since the last time they were in L.A. And Michelle, this is the pod, of course, that we thank everybody for watching about the team that refuses to lose. It doesn't matter if you throw the defending MLS champs at them, every celebrity in Hollywood watching them from around, celebrities from around the world. This even after a, a game like the one before where Nashville adjusted, this team bounces back and makes an impressive statement on the road. We're going to talk a little bit about that and just how far they've come since the, that first game out in L.A. that seems like ages ago. Michelle, how you doing? And how 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 was it watching them just school the defending MLS champs the way they did? Yeah, I mean, that game was one where most people thought that that was going to be their first loss. Even with all of the success they had with the win streak, with winning the League's Cup, everyone thought, okay, well, we've heard this now before. Oh, they're going to play Philadelphia. They're really good. Oh, but they beat them. Okay. Oh, they're going to play Nashville. Nashville is very good. They parked the bus, whatever. They, you know, they beat them and then tie them. Um, they're going to play LA. Everyone thought, wow, in Los Angeles, in front of a crowd that include, I mean, it was unbelievable. The LAFC sent out a list to the media of all the celebrities who were there. And it included, you know, Prince Harry and LeBron James, and obviously, you know, Selena Gomez and, you know, Jason Sudeikis. And I mean, everybody was out there. Everybody was watching that game. Uh, the celebrity stands were packed for that game. The game was sold out. It was the most expensive tickets of all of Messi's summer so far. Uh, the cheapest tickets were going for $600 and $650, going all the way up to $6,000, $7,000. So it was a very, very, very high profile game. And everyone thought this is the one. This is the one where they're finally going to lose. And they end up winning nope. three to one. And, you know, and Messi doesn't score, but he provided two beautiful assists. Those two goals probably would not have happened. Most certainly would not have happened without him. So it was an incredible game, an incredible win for them to be able to pick up three points on the road against the defending champions. And everyone is now trying to figure out the math, you know, what can they do? Because if they could be LAFC on the road in front of, they have an incredible fan base to set aside all the celebrities, their regular fans are very loud and very passionate. And, uh, and even so Miami comes out ahead three to one. I mean, this team now has gone unbeaten in 11 games in a row after going winless 11 games in a row. So they didn't win for 11 straight games, and now they have not lost for 11 straight games since Messi's arrival. This this team produces goals. They produce gifts. I mean, you got Selena Gomez now goes viral. Her shocked face when they almost scored and didn't. I mean, you talk about they, they just can't do it all. And, you know, I mean, this team right now, not just to go in there, but Michelle, but this is the second time that they've taken on one of MLS's best teams and not just gone to their place and won, but dominated. I mean, the Philly game was similar. They went up 3 nothing, you know, completely controlled that game in the first half. And then even this time, they didn't even get the goal when it still kind of mattered. I remember in that game, Philly scored, and then they had the counterpunch to put it away. This time, they didn't even need the counterpunch. That's how dominant they were. And L.A. just never really – I mean, they had chances early on. Where there were a couple of moments, and that's where Drake Callender comes in yet again and how clutch he's been in goal. To stop some of them, like, I read that one-handed one that he had early in the match too. But again, this team, and and that's why it's going to be interesting to see now when some of the main pieces, of course, including Messi, aren't there, how they kind of adjust. But they seem to have progressed enough with their kind of like their original core of guys at, at the forefront to kind of keep this team at least you know pretty sustainably good. Yeah, I mean, the truth is there was a lot of talk at the beginning when we started seeing that players are going to be missing, that this game against Kansas City coming up, oh, you know, there's going to be so many players missing or maybe after there would be. It's really just this game. After this game against Kansas City, everybody returns, including Messi. Um, so, you know, this is the one game that they are going to be missing eight players. Uh, nine players were called into national teams from, from Inter-Miami, which is the most of any MLS team, 
which again, we're talking about the team that was in last place, now second to last place, has the most national team players of any team in the entire league. Uh, Drake Callender, to the surprise and delight of Inter Miami fans, he will be playing this Saturday. Um, mm -hmm. We all reported that he was going to be missing because he was called to the U.S. national team, but it turns out he is going to stay, play this game against Kansas City, and then report to the U.S. national team. So they will have Drake in goal, which is really huge. You just mentioned against L.A. In those first few minutes, L.A. was a dominant team for the first 10 or 15 minutes. And if any of those goals that he saved had gone in, it would have maybe changed the momentum. He made some huge right. saves early on. And uh, so he will be playing on Saturday. And then you still have, even with the guys who are missing, they are going to be missing some key players. They're going to be missing Kramaski. They're going to be missing Kristoff, Robert Taylor, uh, Gomez, Joseph Martinez. But the players who are available are still, even without Messi, which I know that's that's a big loss. We're talking about only the greatest player in the world and possibly only the goat. Yep, will not be playing. The goat will not be playing. However, the goat's friends will be playing. Yet uh, Busquets will be playing. Jordi Alba will be playing. DeAndre Yedlin will be playing. Leo Campana will be playing. Drake Callender will be playing. Uh, um, Kamal Miller will be playing. You're going to have a lot of really key players who are still going to be around who are still going to be playing, um, and Farias, who came in and scored in the right. game today, he'll probably, I would assume, he'll start up on top with Campana. Maybe they'll start two forwards. So there, there still are plenty of players who have proven that they're very good and can play well, even without Leo Messi on the field. Now, the thing is, when Messi doesn't play, a lot of things happen. First of all, it's not only his goals, his assists, his vision that are going to be missed, but it's also his presence, just his presence on the field. It intimidates the other team. The other team is so focused on him that they sometimes forget there are other players around him that will be gone because he's not going to be there. So I think the opponent Kansas city will not be quite as intimidated by this team, even though they're on an 11 game unbeaten streak, they will not be as intimidated as they would if the goat, shows up on the mm -hmm. field that's a very different feel even though all these other players are very good and have proven themselves um you know it's it's still going to be different uh um by the way i wanted to throw in there a little anecdote before we move on from the la game about john mccarthy john mccarthy for inter miami longtime fans he was the goal he was one of the goalkeepers here before he was the backup to Luis Robles. He didn't get to play as much, so he ended up going to LAFC, and he he's worked really, really hard, and he's become the starting keeper out there, and he's done an incredible job. You know, last year they won the title. Uh, anyway, he is the one who ended up getting the jersey from Messi after the game, and uh, it's a pretty funny story. He does not speak Spanish or not much, but he walked up to – he was asked, how did you get Messi's jersey? And he said, I walked up to him and I said, camiseta, por favor. <laughs> he knew those words. Those words he knew in Spanish. Camiseta, por favor. That's all he needed. And, uh, that's all he needed. And Leo gave him. Now, by the way, maybe Leo gave him the jersey because he respected the fact that McCarthy saved two shots of Messi's. Messi took two shots that were saved by McCarthy. One was kind of an easy save. One was a little more difficult save. He made two saves on Messi, so maybe Messi decided to grant him the shirt. Messi had said in an interview that I did with him earlier this year that at uh, the summer that he typically likes if there is an Argentinian player on the opposing team, he likes to swap with an Argentinian player. But in this case, he gave his shirt to McCarthy, and then a couple of funny things happened. One, he had it balled up inside the side of his shorts. He had he didn't want everybody to see that he got Messi's jersey because this has become an issue in MLS this summer. Since Messi arrived, everybody is in awe. Of course, the fans, we've talked about the incredible ticket prices, the crowds that he's drawing, the media crowds that he's drawing. Um, and except for today, by the way, Messi is not there. Well, I guess he would still be drawing. But I will say that the Inter-Miami practice this morning was very different from when Leo Messi is there because there were only two, count them two, one, 
to reporters who showed up. Including and there were, you? there were hundreds. There were Including hundreds you? when Messi first started. It was, there were two people there. So, so, so Michelle, you had flashbacks from how it used to be on the beat basically today. I did. It was very much, I was getting a little teary eyed and actually we got to speak to Victor Ulloa, who is one of the OGs, which I'm going to talk about. So it kind of was a throwback to the OG days of Victor Ulloa, Michelle Kaufman being there and no, when nobody else seemed, you know, really cared very much about this team. Uh, but anyway, John McCarthy was back then on the team uh, in the early days. And what's happened this summer with Messi is that, the opposing players after the game, and it's been an issue after every single road game and every game period that they play, the opposing players want to get pictures of him after the game. They want to get his autograph. They definitely want to get his shirt. So, I mean, they're opposing him and they're playing against him. But then as soon as the game is over, they become fanboys like everybody else. And it's become a little bit controversial because – for example, Dax McCarthy of Nashville, when they lost in the League's Cup final, which was, you know, 11 rounds, PK, super dramatic. Afterward, Dax McCarthy, about an hour after, posted on Instagram, he posted a picture of himself with Messi's jersey. And, it, and his caption was, well, the night wasn't a total loss. And mm -hmm. he got trashed for that because they just lost in the League's Cup final and, you know, he was kind of making a joke, but some fans ripped him for that and said, come on, you know, like you've just lost. You shouldn't be like proudly showing up. Hey, but I got messy shirt. We lost right. the game, but I got messy shirt. Um, so anyway, that's been it's become a little bit of an issue with the opponents that they're getting a little too excited to meet Messi after the game. And maybe the optics are not very good. So John McCarthy got Messi's jersey balled it up and stuck it in the side of his compression shorts. So when he's walking off the field, you see this giant thing sticking out of his thigh. And that was Messi's shirt because he didn't want people to know initially that he had gotten it. Um, he said afterward, he was asked in the press conference about it. He said that he had up until that day, his most prized jersey was he had a signed Michael Jordan jersey. But he hmm. said now that he has Messi's jersey, that one trumps the yeah. signed jersey. Michael Jordan jersey. I mean, those things are collectibles. I mean, think about it, though, the value of those. I mean, I know we we're talking about these athletes are making a ton of money as it is, but these are valuable items, too. I mean, that's something that, you know, either you cherish it and you keep it. But, you know, again, I'm sure that has an, a, a, a substantial dollar value, too, if that were to be, you know, sold or whatever. But uh, it's, it's interesting how, yeah, it turns into messy con. The second the game's over, everybody lining up trying to get autographs or pictures. You know, and, and got, yeah, I, I could see how some fan base, especially the passionate fan bases, are going to be like, what the hell, dude? No, stop uh, get going all gaga over this guy. You know, you, you, you're supposed to beat him, not, you know, not 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 bow down to him and all that stuff. Right. But, you know, I'm going to mention Car not only the fans have brought this up, Carlos Vela, after the game the other night, the Mexican uh, star for LAFC, he mm -hmm. was well, he was really, really mad that they lost the game, obviously, yeah. but he was ripping. He came out and made some very strong statements that MLS, if they want to be taken seriously, their players need to stop, idol, not stop idolizing Messi, but stop being so, you know, so over, yeah. About it. yeah, they're just, he said, this is not professional. You're playing against a team. Yes, it's Leo Messi. Yes, we all recognize he's a great player, but he felt that the opposing players all along, not only his teammates, but so far since Messi arrived that the MLS players are not acting like big time world-class players when they're acting like, you know, a U19 team that's getting a chance to play against Messi. So yeah. he called out his, his peers and said, people need to calm that the players need to calm down about Messi a little bit themselves. And how much I think that also on a subtle level maybe speaks to how MLS by doing this whole signing, it's so they can so they can elevate their brand to be taken seriously with the European leagues and all of that. And now it kind of plays into the whole you don't want to look like, oh, we're so excited because you're you're so much better. You know what I mean? Like that that whole maybe give off that act image like you don't you belong. Act like you belong. The thing exactly. of act like you belong. Act like exactly. you belong. And there are some MLS players that are acting 
like they don't belong. Like they're just right. so excited. And deep down, of course they are deep down. Everyone is excited. And, and the inter Miami guys themselves, when they first met him all said, they all admitted that of course we were excited. I mean, you're meeting Leo Messi. He's all of a sudden going to be your teammate. He's going to be <laughs> a locker room with you. But at some point you have to just settle down and realize that he's just a person, you know? Yeah, I think this is a good segue, too. You mentioned Victor Uloa, and you also mentioned how practice today was a throwback to the old days. But, talk, you know, the journey, you know, the I mean, journey. Victor Uloa was there. Day one, they're playing LAFC, brand new franchise, and now he's there the other day as well. And now he may start in the next game at midfield. But, um, you know, tell me a little bit about just what you, you, you know, from talking to him at practice, just kind of like he sort of encapsulates that whole, from then started that started at the bottom now we're here thing took a, a literal meeting with this team of how how much they've changed yeah victor people forget about victor and he didn't even he wasn't even on the game roster for a bunch of games and mid-season this year before messi got here and before tata got here um he is a guy who's just a complete, when you talk about the consummate team player, the guy with no ego whatsoever, that is Victor Uyoa. And that is why he's lasted this long in the league. He is just, he's a team guy. He's a clubhouse guy. He talked about how the fact that he's bilingual and he really is pure, fully bilingual. He's Mexican American, uh, grew up in the Dallas area, but you know, speaks perfect Spanish and perfect English. He can go seamlessly back and forth between English and Spanish. And he talked about how that has helped him so much in becoming a team leader in MLS and especially on this team right now, which has so many Spanish speaking players who do not speak a, one word of English. Tata Martino, the coach, all the coaching and his whole entire staff is from Argentina. They do all of the training is done in Spanish. All of the team meetings are in Spanish. All of the pregame speeches are in Spanish. So. Victor has been able to be a team translator. And he said, even in the team group chat, like they have a group chat among players and he is the guy who translates between the guys who don't speak Spanish and all the ones who do, which is the majority, but there are still plenty who don't. You have a player from Ukraine. You have a player from Finland. You have, you know, DeAndre Yedlin who's American. You have, you know, there are some American players on this team. Uh, so Victor, was here at the very, very beginning, the very first game that this team played pre-COVID. That's how crazy this was. This was going to be the big team that, you know, with David Beckham as the owner in early March of 2020, they played their first game. I was there. The Miami Herald flew me there for the big inaugural game against LAFC. David Beckham was there. Victoria Beckham was there. It was a big celebration of the brand new team. And they played very well. Victor Uyoa was there. He was on the field that day. He is the only player, literally the only one, who was also on the field for this game the other day. Uh, and, you know, the, the only other two players who were even on the roster back then were Robbie Robinson and Drake Callender. But Drake was not uh, rostered for that game back in 2020. He was like a third backup. So he didn't even make the trip. And in this game, Robbie Robinson, who was in the game, the first one was not in the game this time. So there are three players left from the original roster of 2020 and only one player who played in both games, who is Victor. And, you know, in talking to him about how this team has changed just from, you know, from a brand new startup, you know, team from to a team that now has Leo Messi, Sergio Busquets, Jordi Alba, and Prince Harry, you know, watching your <laughs> games and Owen Wilson, you know, clamoring to get an autograph for his son. Uh, you know, it's been a really wild ride for Victor. And he, sometimes he's been able to play. Sometimes he's on the bench for long stretches. It's been a real roller coaster for him. And one of the toughest moments for him was in that League's Cup final because he had an opportunity to score, you know, in the PKs, they picked him for the decisive PK, which would have been just a storybook moment for him to score the decisive PK, and he missed it. And I mean, he was just crushed, as was probably everybody who was a longtime fan of this team, because he has been such a great team player. He has outlasted two coaches. He's outlasted Higuain. He outlasted Matuidi. He outlasted Pizarro. So many players. The list goes on of all the players who have come and gone. 
and Victor Uyoa is the one guy who's still standing. Um, and so, uh, you know, I decided to profile him this week and write a feature on him because he is deserving. And he has been there from the beginning. He's seen it all. And he has managed to stick around by not only by working hard on the field and in training, which he does, but also by being a real glue guy who keeps everyone together, particularly being a bridge. And he used the word bridge in my interview with him, a bridge between the Anglo speaking players and the Spanish speaking players. Yeah. So he's a really interesting uh, side story that a lot of people who are just casual fans may not realize. Yeah, he, he's the feel good story. I mean, always these championship potentially, well, potentially championship dynasty type teams have those type of guys. And those are the ones you root for the most because they went through all the misery. They went through all the bad days, the long seasons, and now are seeing it pay off. So they're the ones that you really root for. So, and, and I think, you know, from your perspective too, from being there from day one, who else to be able, better to tell it than you've seen, you've seen that journey along with it from a different angle, from a different perspective. But, that's really good too. So ch definitely check out the story. It's going to be on MiamiHerald.com uh, by probably by sometime late Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday night, uh, and in the paper obviously on Thursday. Um, but let's let's talk a little bit about because I know Michelle, we've we've mentioned it briefly, but I don't think we've really uh, taken a big dive into how much we talked about the players and just everything the success has come that's come on the field. But how about it for Tata Martino too to come in here mid season? and really just be able to, to orchestrate this whole thing and, and, and put the pieces together in a way that they're going to work. You know, even from a development standpoint, it's been a short period of time, uh, you know, in general, but you've seen how it's all, how it's starting to mesh, how some of these younger guys are starting to play better, play better. You know, I guess on and off the field, just his impact. And then I don't think a lot of people really know Tata Martino down here, either the person either and how, that relates to his players, but if you can talk about just what you've seen so far. Yeah, I think a lot of people would say, oh, anybody could coach this team. You know, I could walk out there and coach this team. You know, you've got Leo Messi, you've got Busquets, you've got Jordi Alba. I could go out there and win some games in MLS. You know, I mean, but the truth is, let's be honest, I mean, it, it does require coaching to put all these pieces together and particularly to be able to integrate three stars like that into a team that was on a very bad patch and had been losing a lot of games and was losing some confidence to be able to instill this team with confidence, to be able to integrate the new players into the old group. And not only the three uh, stars who came in, but then to bring in uh, Facundo Farias and Thomas Aviles and Diego Gomez, who are three under 22 players that were pretty much handpicked by Tata Martino and Chris Henderson to come in as under 22s, also come in in late July and be able to already be on the field making key contributions. All three of those players have been playing significant minutes. Uh, Aviles and Facundo, you know, started the other day, uh, you know, Gomez playing huge minutes. Um, so he's been able to, in a very short period of time, Tata just arrived here and started coaching in the beginning of, of really in the, the second week of July. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking about not even eight weeks that he's been here. He's already implemented his style. It's very clear what his style is, a very possession game. You know, they've, they've been out possessing, which they had been already doing a lot of out possessing the other team when Phil Neville was the coach. But Tata has been able to come in and instill a lot of confidence into this team um, and, and integrate these, these stars and and somehow integrate the stars with the other players who are feeling kind of down maybe insecure about their, their own selves or the team and what they were going to do and then bring in these three young un under 22 kids blend it all together and he's made some interesting choices he's had to decide between starting joseph martinez or starting leo campana there are a lot of debates about which one should be starting when they're only playing one of them uh then the other day, he decided to start neither of them against L.A. He put in Facundo, Farias, Facu, they call him. They, they put in Facu with, with uh, Messi because he felt that that was the best option. Um, what I will tell you about him, I've spoken to some players about him, and I asked them, you know, tell us what he's like as a manager. We, you know, we know he has a, a great resume, obviously. He already has coached 
the Argentine national team, one of the best national teams in the world. He's coached the Argentine national team. He coached the Mexican national team. He coached at Barcelona. He coached Lionel Messi and Busquets at Barcelona. He coached Lionel Messi with the Argentine national team. Even though they didn't have as much success, uh, he still has coached on the very, very highest levels of international soccer and, and you know club soccer. But what is he like as a, as a manager? And a lot of them have said the same thing. He is very, very, very detail oriented. One thing that keep they keep bringing up is that his meetings, his video sessions are very, very, very long. All the players kind of joke and smirk about it. They say that once a week, apparently, there is a video session right before the next game. And apparently it's extremely long. No one would tell me exactly how long, but they all just said really, really, really long and longer than any other video sessions that they had experienced with other coaches. But they said that he is so detail oriented and he wants to go over every single scenario that the team may face. And he goes over individual scenarios with all the players, one by one by one, individual scenarios that different players are going to face. He's a real student of the game. He studies the opponent, his staff, he and his staff, study the opponent very carefully. And this is not to say that the former staffs didn't or whatever, but this is something that all the players have pointed out, that his video sessions are very, very long and very, very detailed, and that that has really helped them in preparation. And then the other thing is just the confidence that they have that he wants them to go out and play freely. And Phil Neville had talked about that also, about trying to get guys to go out and play with freedom and play like they don't have shackles on them. But they really, really, really seem to be getting that message from, from Tata. And of course, having Leo Messi, Busquets, and Alba as three of your key players in three different parts of the field, that is going to help players play more freely because you're automatically going to have confidence if you go into a game knowing that those three are your teammates and those three guys are going to be on the field, I think you're going to feel a little bit better about your chances than if they were not on the field. It's just like if you were a betting person or if you're just a random fan, when you see those three players on the roster, you're saying Miami has a chance to win. And that carries over to the players too. Those same players who were here earlier in the year were hoping to win games. Now I think they believe, truly believe when they go in with these new teammates that they will win, that they have an excellent chance to win. And, and you know, part of that is the messaging that Tata is giving, the attention to detail, you know, keeps stressing. He keeps stressing to them that, that he wants them to play freely. All of the instruction goes on during the week. If you notice during the games, he's he's not much of a, he doesn't, you know, run around as much and he doesn't give as much instruction on the field as some coaches have different styles. Uh, you know, he much more does a lot of the preparation during the week. And then on game day, he seems to be a little bit more reserved on the sidelines. So, yeah. you know, that's his style. It's, it's obviously working, whatever he's doing. And clearly having the players he has, you're going to have a better chance to win than, than if you don't have those players. I'm sure Phil Neville yeah. would have loved to have had Leo Messi, Sergio Busquets, and Jordi Alba on the field, he never had that opportunity. Right. But Tata has done a great job, and and he should get he should get credit for a lot of the success they're having. But I think that's something in, in sports too. That kind of you know sometimes coaches, some of the great coaches. Uh, I mean, I remember like back in the day, Phil Jackson used to get that all the time. Like, oh, of course, he's got Michael Jordan, and then you know later on he had Shaq and Kobe. But there's something to be said about about managing those pieces and putting them in the right place, managing big egos too. In, in some cases, you know what I mean? And I love the point you made, not just the time spent in the lab and studying film and all that, but like you said, a lot of times managing those kids too that are thinking, oh God, we just got superstar, you got messy, we got this guy, that. what's going to happen to me? Am I on the street tomorrow? Am I? And they're not, and making them feel like you still have a valuable role on this team, that's important too, and amazing how he's been able to do that in such a short time and make it work. Yeah, I think it's really important to point out that the the meshing of this team, the stars and the and the the people who were here before and the young kids. You know what could happen if the manager is not doing a good job, if the if the coach is not doing a good job and and is that those three guys would come in and they may be resented. 
They may be resented by those who were there before. They may be resented if the, those players who were playing those positions are now no longer starting because those three guys came. That could cause friction in a locker room. That could cause a divide in the locker room between the, you know, the new guys and the old guys. And, you know, yeah, it's great to have Messi here, but he's getting all the attention. What about me? I was here from day one. No one's paying attention to me. Those kinds of things can creep up in a locker room. And all it takes is one or two players like that who are negative and to have, they become a cancer in the locker room. And that has not happened. Uh, one reason is Tata for sure. He's been able to manage all the egos and blend in these young guys and these former guys even guys who have not played very many minutes since these uh, new guys have come, they still seem to be cheering for their teammates on the sideline. The other thing is that Messi, Busquets, and Alba are so humble. All three of them, they do not act like stars. They really right. do not act like stars. They came in here and they just want to be treated the same as all the other players. They treat all the other players the same way that they treat other big name stars that were making millions in Europe. Those guys are used to playing with players who are making tens of millions of dollars in Europe with Barcelona, PSG. Now they're playing with some kids who are literally, I'm not joking, making $67,000 a year, making $80,000 a year. These are now their teammates but they treat them as equals. They really do. I've seen it just in watching and they've all talked about it. All the young kids have talked about how they were so nervous to meet these guys. And once they met them, they treated them the same. So between Tata and these three players, being able to be so humble and treating everybody the same, not having a star system, even though clearly you've got the goat of the entire sport is in your locker room with you now. Um, but, but they've been able to to mesh together the chemistry in this team is almost what's the most remarkable part about this run is the chemistry of these players, the way they hug each other and the way Messi jumps into Kramaski's arms and whatever, they act like they've been playing together for years and they've literally been playing together six or seven weeks. Some of them even less, uh, you know, the new young kids who came, we're talking about, they got here three weeks ago. They got her three weeks ago. And all of a sudden, that you know they've been teammates with Messi Busquets, you know, for 15 years. So the chemistry of this team is what I've been really most impressed with, and, and that's what can carry a team. Now that you're talking about making a, a push to the playoffs, which we should talk about, you know, what is their mathematical yeah. chances? What do they have to do? Uh, it's crunch time yeah. now, but this kind of chemistry that they have and their locker room attitude is is really conducive to a team making a late season run. Yeah, it, it's almost yeah, it, like they hit a home run, not just actually physically signing these guys, but the fact that that kind of off the field personality also, you went, they won the lottery, basically. You not only got your big three, but you got a, a humble big three that will gel and make that whole thing click. And yeah, like you said, let's uh, let's dive right into that, because the next one, Sporting KC, we, you talked about it earlier, a few, obviously, including Lionel Messi. Several, a few players are going to be out for this one, but that was the thing. You have this great win over LAFC, and you're like, Oh my god, they just destroyed the league champs! Eh, all it did was narrow the gap from 14 to 13. Like that, that shows you how much of an uphill battle it's still going to be to make up those points. I believe it's what eight points right now behind DC United for the final, and then even that spot, like you explained in one of your articles. I think, like you keep saying, people sometimes people don't even know how the system works, it's only to get in the play in round. That's not even to get an actual cement yourself in the postseason, but it does at least get you a ticket. But the point being, eight points, you're talking three wins. So that and, and in the sport of soccer, we've seen, especially in these leagues that are standing completely standings based, how much of a wide gap that really it doesn't sound like much, but it really is. So every win counts. They almost have to win out, I think, or close to it to get in. So how do you see this matchup? Can they get those valuable three points even without all these guys? Yeah, I mean, I think the game, it, it really is critical. So, yeah, as far as numbers go, for those of you who like math, and I don't like math, but, <laughs> I did, you know, number for the number crunchers out there, it is important yeah. at this time of the season. There are nine games left for Inter-Miami. By the way, that is two more than a lot of other teams have. Miami has two games in hand, which is really important to bring up because – when the other teams finish out, Miami is still going to have two more games to play. So Miami is Miami has played two fewer games than several of the teams that are that are ahead of them. So that is going to factor in in the final couple weeks of the season. 
Miami has nine games left, okay? Right now they have 25 points. They have 25 points. The ninth place team has 33 points, which is D.C. So they're eight points short. So looking back in history, over the last three seasons, the ninth place team had 43 plus points, 43.1, 43.2, whatever. Uh, last year's ninth place team had 42 points. So let's just even say 42 points. Miami has to get from 25 points to 42 points in nine games. It means they have to average two points per game, two plus a little fraction. They have to average, they can't be averaging tight. They have to average two points per game, which means they are going to have to win out almost all of their games. Of the nine games, they're going to have to win the vast majority of those games to have a chance to reach 42 points, which may, you know, it may or may not be, but the last three years, it's been around that range. Um, so for them to reach that, they are going to have to almost win out all their games. This Kansas City game is one that on paper looks like a winnable game. It's a team that is not one of the top teams. Uh, it's going to be at home, okay? It's going to be at home, which is always good for Inter Miami. Although there is a hurricane or a, a tropical <laughs> storm that may turn into a hurricane by this weekend, which, by the way, considering the history of this team, I always say Mother Nature is definitely not an Inter Miami fan because this team has had more rain delays and lightning oh delays. Oh my God, than have they ever? Than yes, team I've ever covered. So if there's bad weather coming this weekend, I guarantee you it will land at exactly seven o'clock during warm-ups of this game. Mark my words. This one, I think his name is it Leo. I forget. Lee. Oh my God, what if it's Leo? Is it Leo? Lee, Lee. It's close. No, Lee. no, it's called okay. Lee. Yeah. Close to Leo now. Okay, but Lee, guess who Lee, got out Lee, of town? Lee, Lee Messi, Messi meet Leo Messi. Town. Right. Leo, Leo Messi, Messi got Leo, out of town. Messi. Yeah. Leo Messi got out of town for this potential hurricane. Anyway, um, <laughs> so yeah, it is going to be a tough, you know, they are going to be missing. They're going to be missing Robert Taylor. They're going to be missing uh, Kristoff. They're going to be missing uh, Kramaski. They're going to be missing Joseph Martinez. They're missing uh, Gomez, who's playing with Paraguay. They're missing David Ruiz, who's playing with Honduras. Uh, so they're missing, you know, uh, Ascona, who's playing with Dominican Republic, although he hasn't had many minutes. So they're going to be missing eight players against Kansas City, but, and Messi, of course, Mr. Lionel Messi will not be here, uh, which means, by the way, one positive for that, for you fans out there, the ticket prices are the lowest that they've been since they arrived, since, since he arrived. So if you want to go to a game, you're not going to get to see Messi, but you'll get to see Busquets and Alba at a discount price. So keep that in mind. Ticket prices will be lower this week, and then they'll shoot right back up when he comes back. Uh, but anyway, this game is a game that I think is winnable. Even with Leo Messi missing, um, obviously Kansas City will be fired up to beat them and to break this streak that Miami's on. But I think that with all the players that Miami does have, and I think it is critical that Drake Callender stayed behind to play this game. If Drake Callender was not starting this game, I think it would be I, I think it would be a really really tall task. He has been so clutch this year. Uh, with him in goal. It'll give people a lot of confidence. Your back is going to be fairly similar. You're going to have Alba. You're going to have Kamal Miller. You're going to have Aviles. You're going to have uh, Yedlin. All of those guys have been starting all along. Uh, you know, maybe Noah Allen will get it there. He's gotten a lot of experience already this year. Uh, you know, the midfield will have Busquets. Uh, you know, and then up top, you can still have Leo Campana and you can have Farias. So those guys. And then Robbie Robinson will be on the bench. Um, I think this is a team that still could beat Kansas City. It will be critical, though. They really do need the three points. And this is one of the games that's home. It's much harder to win on the road, although they've been winning everywhere. Um, I think this is a game that they could win even without Leo Messi. But it will not be as dominant a team, I don't think, without Leo Messi. Like I said before, his presence alone on the field is so daunting for the other team that he distracts everybody. He distracts the fans. He distracts everybody. He distracts the opponent. So um, without him there, I think Kansas City will rest a little bit easier, but I still think it's a game that Miami could win at home if the hurricane doesn't hit. Yeah, I think so. I, I think this is going to be an interesting case study of a game too because you're going to see how they react without him there 
can they put together a victory? It's going to be a good experience for them because they're not always going to have him there, you know, not just for him going away for a, a qualifying game, but who knows? It could be other circumstances one day. So it's good for them to be prepared. But also the point you made, too, about the fans and the lower ticket prices, do they show up in force like they've been? Or do we start seeing some empty seats out there? Maybe not a lot because this team has has been able to pack the house in the past, even with, with in the pre-Messi era. But I wonder if you start to see maybe a little bit of that because maybe fans, even with the smaller, with the lower ticket prices, are like, eh, he's not playing. I don't care. Or do they start to come out now no matter what and support this team? So that part of it I think is going to be interesting too. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting to see who are the real fans. I mean, I can tell you from the media standpoint, like I told you, there were two media members there right. today. So, you know, Messi is the big draw. Messi, you know, we can't hide it. Messi is the big draw. He's he's the greatest player in the world. He has 469 million Instagram followers. This guy is very, 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 very popular. You saw all the celebrities that came out to that game against L.A. So, you know, he is the big draw. Without him here, how will the team respond? How will the fans respond? How will the energy be in the stadium? Um, I think that'll be very, very, very interesting to see. Um, but, you know, I think his teammates want to show him, if anything, they would like to show him that they can win without him. They would like to show him and, and, and you know, have a victory for him, if you, you know, if you will, uh, because he's gone and, you know, he loves to play and he wants to play every minute of every game. He's not going to be there. They don't want to let him down and, you know, play like poop and lose the game. And, uh, you know, and then Messi's sitting there in Argentina somewhere watching. Uh, I think they would like to win uh, for themselves to show that they can win without him and also for him. I think they would like him not to feel bad that they can't win without him. I, I think there's a lot of motivation for this team and they need the three points. They need to keep this streak going if they're going to have any chance to reach 42, 43, 44 points, which is what they're going to need. They only have 25 points right now. You know, right. and so they have a long way to go to hit ninth. And if you get into ninth place, the eighth and ninth place teams play in a playoff game, in a play in game to get into the final eight for the playoffs. So, like you said, it's not even if you finish ninth, you're not really in the playoffs, you're in the play in game to get into the playoffs. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a lot of motivation for them to try to get those points every single game. And after that, they're going to have some games on the road that are going to be tough. You know, they have Atlanta on the road. They're going to have Chicago. They're going to have Orlando on the road, Charlotte. So they've got a lot of road games left. Uh, they really need to win this home game against Kansas city on Saturday. Yeah. yeah and that's the whole thing though. Playoffs have begun. And even after that, let's say they do win that play play in game. It's all single elimination. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So, I mean, really, yes, they've won. They've, they've have not lost in 11 straight but they really can't afford to lose at all. I mean, I mean, very, very few. I mean, if they're going to make this, if they're going to make it even to the play in game. So really the playoffs, like we mentioned before, really the playoffs already began with this team. The second they started playing the MLS. Playing MLS. MLS. Yeah. So, but we'll see what happens. I mean, they will see if they can handle it, get those three points. We'll see how many people actually show up to watch it happen or not happen at drive pink stadium on Saturday, catch it uh, as they face uh, sporting KC and catch us. As you always do, we appreciate all the viewership, all the listenership on our pod. Remember, you can listen to it. If you're not watching it, you can listen to it on all your favorite podcatchers, you know, uh, iTunes, Spotify, you name it. And, of course, you can watch this show at MiamiHerald.com and on YouTube. For Michelle Kaufman, I'm Andre Fernandez. We'll be back next week to uh, see what happens with Inter Miami and if they're still on this unbeaten streak. Until then, thanks for watching, everybody.